Wouldn't it be great if we could take a sequence like this and notice that it equals n plus 1 over n plus 2, which converges to 1, times n plus 1 over n plus 2, which converges to 1, and thus assume that its limit must be 1 times 1, or 1. That way we wouldn't have to go through the time-consuming process of proving that a sequence like this converges using the definition. But we don't know if the limits of sequences behave in this nice way unless we prove it. We'll prove that if an converges to a and bn converges to b, then the sequence whose nth term is an times bn converges to a times b. So the product of convergent sequences converges to the product of the limits of those sequences. As usual, to prove this sequence converges to what we would like it to, we'd have to begin by taking an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero. Then we want to show that the distance between terms of our sequence and the desired limit a, b is eventually less than epsilon. So we want to be able to make this expression arbitrarily small. To prove our previous limit laws, we related an expression like this to some expressions that we knew we could make arbitrarily small. Since we know that a n converges to a, we know that we can make the absolute value of a n minus a as small as we want, and similarly, we can make the absolute value of b n minus b as small as we want. To prove our previous limit laws, we used the triangle inequality theorem in order to relate this expression to these expressions. However, it's not so obvious right now how we could do that. For this proof, we need to be a bit more clever. A common tactic for real analysis proofs is to take an expression like this and then sort of separate it like this and insert in the middle minus something and plus that same thing. In doing this, we certainly haven't changed the value of the expression, we just subtracted and added the same thing, so we added zero. What we would then do is pair our original first term with the thing we subtracted, and the thing we added with what was originally our second term. Then we could apply the triangle inequality theorem and split this expression up at this addition. The question, of course, is what's the thing that we should subtract and add? Naturally, it should probably consist of things we've already introduced, like a, b, a, n, and b, n. Furthermore, we might suspect that we should make it a product of two things, since it's being paired with products of two things. If we're going to make it a product of two things, then maybe we should ensure that it has something in common with a, n, b, n, and it has something in common with a, b. Finally, those clues may lead us to try subtracting a times b, n, and adding a times b, n. And then we'll just see if that turns out to be useful. So we started with this, which we know we want to make less than epsilon to prove that a n b n converges to a b, and then we rewrote it like this, just subtracting and adding a times b n, so we haven't changed the value of the expression. And now that we have the absolute value of the sum of two terms, we can try applying the triangle inequality theorem. We know that this is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values of these two expressions. And then, since we were careful to choose a times b n so that it has something in common with both of these terms, we can do a little bit of factoring here. Out of this expression, we can factor out the absolute value of b n. So this is equal to the absolute value of b n multiplied by the absolute value of a n minus a. Oh, that looks good, because we can make this as small as we want. Similarly, we can factor out the absolute value of a from this expression. So it's equal to the absolute value of a multiplied by the absolute value of b n minus b. And we can make that as small as we want too. So it looks like we made a good choice, subtracting and adding a times b n. Now we're getting close to figuring out how to put this proof together. We know that we're going to want this all to be less than epsilon. To ensure for that, we would like both of these terms of our sum to be less than half epsilon. 
over here on the right, that shouldn't be too difficult because we can make the absolute value of bn minus b as small as we want since bn converges to b. We do also have this getting multiplied by the absolute value of a, but that is just some constant number, so we can make this small enough to account for that. In particular, in order to ensure that this term of the sum is less than epsilon over 2, just how small should we make the absolute value of bn minus b? We might say, let's make it less than epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of a. That way, the absolute values of a will cancel out, and we'll just have that it's less than epsilon over 2 as desired. The only problem is that the absolute value of a might be 0. We don't know what a is, so we could be dividing by 0 here. So in order to avoid that problem, we'll want to add 1 in the denominator. And I just rewrote the denominator, so hopefully it's a little more clear what it is. It can get a little confusing with the 1 and the absolute value bars. Now, coming over to this term in the sum, things are a little bit more tricky. Again, we want it to be less than epsilon over 2 and we can make a n minus a, that absolute value part, as small as we want. However, instead of having some constant number over here, like we did with this term, we have the absolute value of b n. We're going to need this string of inequalities to hold for all terms of our sequence after a certain point, so b n could be any number of things. However, since it's a convergent sequence, we know that it is bounded. So since b n is a convergent sequence, we know it is bounded, and that means there exists exists a real number c that is greater than or equal to the absolute value of every term in the sequence. There will be links in the description to my lesson proving that convergent sequences are bounded and my lesson proving that a bounded sequence has this property, that its absolute value is also bounded. Now because we're trying to make this term small, we can basically treat the absolute value of bn as a worst case scenario and imagine a replacing it with its upper bound c. In other words, we know that the absolute value of bn is less than or equal to c. Thus, in order to ensure that this term is less than epsilon over 2, how small do we need to make the absolute value of a n minus a? Well, we might think to make it less than epsilon over 2 times c. Then we could replace the absolute value of bn with c, and that would cancel out with this c, and we'd be left with epsilon over 2. However, just as we did over here, we have the problem that c might be equal to 0. So to ensure we're not dividing by 0, we'll add 1 in the denominator. Note that adding 1 in these denominators won't cause any problems, because making the denominator bigger just makes the numbers smaller. So we're making the numbers even smaller than they need to be. Now we want to go apply the definition of a convergent sequence to the absolute value of a n minus a and of b n minus b in order to name the big n values that are going to guarantee this inequality and this inequality. So I'll erase most of this scratch work and we'll see how all of these pieces come together. Let's bring this line back up and then we'll make all of this a little bit smaller so we can do a little bit of work with the absolute value of a n minus a and the absolute value of b n minus b. So by definition of a convergent sequence, we know there exists a natural number big N1 so that for all n greater than big N1, the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon over 2c plus 1, just as we desired. Similarly, since bn is a convergent sequence, there exists a natural number, big N2, so that for all n greater than big N2, the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of a plus 1. 
Because remember, since an converges to a and bn converges to b, we can make these expressions smaller than any positive number we want. And we know that both of these numbers are positive because epsilon is positive, c is greater than or equal to the absolute value of every term of bn, thus it has to be at least zero, and the absolute value of a, of course, is at least zero. And then remember, we have the plus one in the denominator to make sure that neither of these numbers are undefined. So we've definitely got two perfectly valid positive numbers, and so we can guarantee the existence of big N1 and big N2. So finally, to bring everything together and make our proof work, what is our big N value going to be to show that A N B N converges? Well, we'll want it to be at least as big as big N1 and big N2, so we'll take big N to be the maximum of those two numbers. We'll go ahead and shrink this and set it back off to the side and bring back the work that we were doing. We set big N equal to the max of big N1 and big N2 2, and then consider n greater than big N. Then, as always, we have the absolute value of terms of our sequence minus the desired limit a times b. We know that's equal to this, just subtracting and adding the same thing, minus ABN plus ABN. Then we apply the triangle inequality theorem to split it up across that addition. So we have that this is less than or equal to the absolute value of ANBN minus ABN plus the absolute value of ABN minus AB. We then factor out the absolute value of bn from this expression and factor out the absolute value of a from this expression. Finally, we've got to put on the finishing details to show that this is less than epsilon. We know n is greater than big N, which means it's also greater than big N1 and big N2, which means we're guaranteed that the absolute value of a n minus a is less than epsilon over 2c plus 1. So we can replace it with that to make the expression bigger. So this is less than the absolute value of b n times epsilon over 2c plus 1. Similarly, since n is greater than big N2, we have guaranteed that the absolute value of bn minus b is less than epsilon over two times the absolute value of a plus one. So we can replace it with that and make the expression bigger. Then recall that since our sequence of bn is convergent, it is bounded, and we said that c was an upper bound on the absolute value of bn. So we know that all of this is is less than or equal to replacing the absolute value of bn with its upper bound, that would be c. Finally, let me try to explain this last step elegantly. Epsilon over two is epsilon cut into two parts, right? So epsilon over two c plus one is epsilon cut into more than two c parts. So if we have epsilon cut into more than two c parts, since it's two c plus one, and we only have c of those parts, that's going to be less than half epsilon. And I'll explain that logic again over here. We have epsilon cut into more than two absolute value of a parts, and we have absolute value of a of those parts. So that's not even half of the parts. It's not even half epsilon. So epsilon over two is greater. So each of these pieces is less than half epsilon, and so this sum is less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is equal to epsilon. That was awesome. I've shrunken the work down so it fits on the screen. We've just seen that for an arbitrary epsilon greater than zero, we can find a number big N so that every term of our sequence after the big nth term is within epsilon of A times B. Thus, if a n converges to a and b n converges to b, then a n times b n converges to a b. The product of convergent sequences converges to the product of their limits.